A very good morning to you. Welcome to Bethel Bible Fellowship. We're uh, delighted to uh, be able to share this time together. Every day is the Lord's day, every single day. And yet we have the, the blessed privilege of being able to corporately gather together to worship the Lord. And uh, particularly this morning, we're going to be uh, continuing our study in Luke chapter 12. If you turn there with me, we'll be looking at the very first 12 verses. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after the killing of the body, has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid, for you are worth more than many sparrows. I tell you, whoever acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge him before the angels of God. But he who disowns me before men will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you are brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. Our Father, as we open this passage this morning, we have the privilege of asking you to instruct us with your heart, through your spirit, that we might see and grasp and understand whether we know you or whether or not each of us is both challenged and encouraged from this passage. And so, Father, may it touch each and every heart and ear the way you so choose. We entrust this time to you for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. For the past 31 years, I've had the privilege of serving as a chaplain for a particular federal agency. About six or eight weeks ago, one of our retired employees uh, was shot and killed. And the agency decided to host a, um, a memorial service for this individual. I was contacted and I was asked to both do an invocation and a benediction for that service. And it was going to be held at this agency's location. And I thought to myself, wow, gee, they're asking me? Uh, huh, I must be real special. Huh, I must, I must really be hot stuff, you know? Until I found out that everybody else they asked couldn't come. <laughs> oh, how the flesh gets in the way so very quickly. And so in this passage, I have once again been challenged to hold the mirror up to myself. And I invite you to do the same thing as we look together at this portion and in the allotted time attempt to try to unpack it in the best of our ability. We are looking in this passage at hypocrisy and how to avoid it, and we see some encouragements to the believer. There are four reasons to be afraid in this passage. Now, we don't like to talk about fearing God. Oh, no. 
No, no, no. We want to talk about the fact that God is love. Oh, that's all. He welcomes anybody. Oh, he just loves. He forgives. And that's a... But in this passage, four different aspects and reasons for fear of God are presented by the Lord Jesus Christ. And two, encouragement, two encouragements interwoven amongst those fearful statements. We see here that the very beginning, it's important for us, I think, to kind of grasp the background. It says here, meanwhile, a crowd of many thousands had gathered. I don't know, probably some of your trans translations vary in the way that's rendered. Uh, the term that's used there is myriads. And uh, it's interesting, you know, I didn't know this. <clears throat> uh, kind of squeaking, aren't I? Let's see if I can water that down. And so, myriads is uh, the term that's used here is the largest term, the largest number in the language of the New Testament. And so when it talks about many myriads, and that's why in the Revelation we see myriads of myriads, literally 10,000 times 10,000 angels, for instance. Well, here we have myriads of people gathered together. So it makes no sense to think it was just limited to two. It says it's, it's got to be more than that. And literally what we're seeing here is thousands upon thousands, tens of thousands. I think at a minimum we could say 30,000 people were gathered. And I thought that is, that is incredible to me. I mean, that's more than twice what the Pan American Center holds. And this was in a time when there was no PA, there was no internet, there was uh, no social media to advertise. These people gathered. And I think what we see here is we see a crescendo in Jesus' ministry for a couple of reasons. You know, Jesus, back in chapter 11, just last week, uh, we saw here that Jesus referred to the crowds, he says, as they increased... He said, this is a wicked generation. That's what he told them. He said, the wicked, wicked generation asked for a sign, but none will be given to it. You know, he had severely reproved them. And then we see, as Jeff brought out aptly to us, the, the many woes that Jesus pronounced against the Pharisees and the religious leaders, those condemnations. And so we see that he, he reproves the the crowds, and yet, in this passage, they came back. They came back. They handled his reproof better than the Pharisees did. Wow. It seems like the more that the Pharisees strove to drive people away from Christ, the more they came. The more they came. And here was this innumerable multitude all of them gathering together so that they were stepping on one another, trying to get close enough so they could just hear what the teacher had to say. Can you imagine having a church where people were stepping on each other just to try to get in the door, to try to hear the word of God? Well, we see that what Jesus begins here in chapter 12 and it goes on into chapter 13 is a whole single sermon punctuated with a couple of interruptions, we'll say, but it's all on warning. Warning. And he begins with this verse 1. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees which is hypocrisy. You know, now when we think of hypocrisy, you know, the things, uh, certain terms may come, come to our mind. Fake, phony, fraud, shyster, liar. But all of these kinds of things tend to, to be used in the realm of the material world. The word hypocrisy is primarily focused at spiritual 
deception. And that's what the warning is here. And Jesus is pointing out the deceptive spiritual practices of the Jews, the leaders of the Jews, the fierce spiritual leaders in his day. Carrying over, we need to understand that all false religion is hypocrisy. All false religions. We have a lot of warnings. Jesus makes warnings in other places about against hypocrisy. He says, guard yourself against the leaven of the Pharisees here. But in Matthew 16, he says, he says uh, beware of the leaven of the Sadducees, which is hypocrisy. And then he, he actually, in Mark 8, said also, beware of the leaven of Herod. Wow. Basically, keep away. Keep away from their false teaching. You know, Psalm 1, verse 1 says this, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Keep away, Jesus says, and examine your own heart. Think of it. And Jesus here says, he addresses, first of all, he began to speak first to his disciples. Now, we've talked about that before, that that term is a general term for learners. We see that it's used back in, in John chapter 6 or 8. I'm going to throw that out because I forgot now. Where many of the disciples, after some of the hard sayings that Jesus said, many of the disciples, those learners, no longer followed him. And that's where he turns to Peter and says, are you going to leave also? So we have a mixture of people, probably in, in, in every which way. Uh, they were, there were some that may have, been, uh, may have been true believers, true seekers. Others were maybe skeptics, wanting to learn more. Others were, well, I don't know. I think, you know, this guy's... I think he's all wet, but, you know, the crowds are going. You know, a crowd draws a crowd. And, you know, and then you had a guy, you had different people's motives. Later on in this chapter, one comes to Jesus and says, hey, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. So you've got all different kinds of people that are there. Well, the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, what was it that Jesus was talking about? Well... Whatever they did, they did for men and not for God. They did it for show. They did it to be seen. They did it to receive the accolades. They did it to be revered. I won't have time to read the passages in Matthew 6. Be careful. Don't do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them, Matthew 6, 1. 6, 2, when you give, don't announce it as the, as the hypocrites do, to be honored by men. Later on, he says, when you pray, don't do it to be seen by men. Later in the chapter, verse 16, he says, when you fast, don't make yourself look so obviously distraught and distressed because then you people will know you're fasting. Oh, and they'll think, oh, how godly. Oh, how spiritual. And in Matthew 23, Jesus says this of them, everything they do is for men to see. And we read in Luke 16, Jesus talks about the fact that, they, that you cannot serve both God and mammon or money and the very next verse, it says, verse 14 of chapter 16, it says, The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. And Jesus said to them, You're the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your heart. And the love of money is another evidence of hypocrisy. And Peter, excuse me, Paul addresses that in 1 Timothy about those who teach false doctrines and they think that 
Uh, they are men of corrupt mind, been robbed of the truth, who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. Does that ring a bell of familiarity? Not just back then, but today. So Christ said to these things to a broad group, don't buy in to the false religion that they're spewing. Most people in hell will have been religious. Why is hypocrisy like leaven? Jesus says, watch out for the leaven. Well, Matthew 13, uh, he told a parable of the kingdom of heaven is like yeast leaven that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. You know, my wife used to make homemade bread, and boy, she'd beat the living daylights out of that dough. You know, it was, she was probably thinking of me. But, uh, <laughs> but the, the situation is that the more you beat on it and pound it and mix it water, it doesn't take but a little bit of yeast, and it works through, and it gets into every aspect of that bread, and it pervades. It pervades that entire loaf. How do we avoid or escape the pervasiveness of hypocrisy? How do we stay away from false religion? We have four warnings aimed at the hypocrite or us who may be slipping into hypocrisy, believers, and two encouragements. Fundamentally, we're going to see here it's necessary for us to honor God, the Father, honor Christ, the Son, and honor God, the Holy Spirit. All three of these members uh, are members of the Godhead, co-equal. They are the Trinity, and this passage is a Trinitarian passage. You can't escape that. All three are clearly portrayed here. All three participated in the sacrifice, our salvation. All three participated in the resurrection. I don't have time to go through all the passages, but the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were all involved in the sacrifice of Christ himself. And in the resurrection, all three participated in raising Jesus from the dead. So let's look at our first truth, our first warning. Two reasons here that Jesus talks about to fear God or honor God. Well, we have the fact that, first of all, everything will be revealed. Verses 2 and 3. Be on your guard of the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And then he goes in, he says, why? Why do we need to be on guard? And it's interesting here that I have to say this, that Jesus is talking to disciples and obviously including the 12. And yet he speaks to them of the warning against hypocrisy. If he's warning them, the ones who were the best of the best, those who were walking with him daily, against hypocrisy, how do we need to hear and heed that same warning ourselves? So he says here in verse 2, the first reason to be afraid, quite frankly, is that there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. Don't fear men. Don't try to impress men. Don't be hypocritical. Why not? Well, the first reason is, guess what? Nothing will be hidden. Everything will be Revealed. Oh, hypocr hypo hypocrites, you know, that, that term originally in the New Testament times was a reference to uh, play actors, those who wore a mask 
And you've seen, you know, the, the two masks, the, the happy face and the, the sad one, you know, when it portrays a play kind of a thing. That was the picture of a hypocrite, one who pretended to be something or someone that he was not. And that was the picture here. But what we have here is this. Jesus is warning, and hypocrites, they, they keep their, their intentions to themselves. They're hidden. But Jesus says, everything will be revealed. And he uses these three comparisons. There's nothing that's, that's covered that isn't going to be revealed. And then he says, there's nothing you've said in the dark that won't be heard in the daylight. And there's nothing you've whispered in the most, most secret inner place where you thought nobody could hear ever that will be proclaimed, will not be proclaimed from the rooftops. Those three very intense pictures for us. To saying, for us, everything will be revealed. Hebrews 4.12 says this, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates to the dividing of the soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Only the word of God can cut there because... You can't see my thoughts and intents. I cannot see yours. But God does. And he reveals them through his word. We'll talk more about what the spirit of God does in that regard. In Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 20. Do not curse the king even in your thoughts. And do not curse the rich while in your bedroom. For a bird might report what you are thinking. Or some winged creature might repeat your words. What a warning. What a picture. And in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14, God will evaluate every deed, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. And in Romans 2, verse 16, Paul refers to the day when God will judge the secrets of human hearts. What day is that? The final day of judgment. I would love to go to Rome to Revelation 20, share with you there, but for limited time, we can't do it. We see there that all things will be revealed, they're recorded, everything is recorded. We have a set of books, and we have the book, the book of Lamb's book of life, and we have the books. And what a picture that is of a complete revelation of what life will be for, what judgment will be for the unbeliever, those who have not found themselves in the book of life through faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We have a second warning now in verses 4 and 5. A second warning, a second reason to fear God. Here Jesus spoke to Tens of thousands of people. And what is his focus in this passage? And pretty much through the whole thing we're looking at this morning? Hell. Well, we don't like to talk about hell. I have a lot of, we see, oh, goodness gracious, a lot of uh, uh, responses, uh, surveys that are done. Oh, how many people you now claim to be Christians? How many people believe in heaven? How many people believe in a literal hell? You see that kind of stuff come all around. Well, Jesus chooses before tens of thousands to speak about hell. I've heard some people say, ah, what's, the, what's this, all this interest in eternity when we need to be regarding how we live now? Well, it's true. We need, we need to pay attention to how Jesus tells us to live now, to follow him now. And yet that's not what he talks about here. He warns of hell. He says, get your focus right. Second reason to fear God, because he alone has the power of eternal life and death. He alone. Do not fear men who can only kill the body. Boy, we are so stuck on this thing, me included. Well, we see, we take good care of it to the best of our ability. We do all we can. And yet, we sometimes, on, and you see, as you see people begin, as we age, like me, begin to falter, and things begin to fail. Where's our focus? Or sometimes in regard to 
whatever situation may be at work or with our friends or whatever, and we see that people look down upon us and, and maybe we begin to suffer some measure of persecution. And Jesus says, don't worry about that. And a number of our dear brothers and sisters are facing life and death issues for the cause of Christ. And Jesus says here, don't fear men because the worst they can do is kill the body. And folks, we're losing it anyway. We're losing it anyway. Put your attention where it needs to be. Fear God. Now, I've got to say something here because as we work our way through the other three reasons to fear, and we don't like to talk about fear, I need to present you with a very important truth and principle. There is a very vital reason that we need to fear God. Because it drives us to Him. It drives us to Him. And we see that the only relief from that fear is found in Jesus Christ. Fear drives us to the Lord and his solution. Jesus is warning us, you need to get it right. You need to get it right. And he says here in, in these next verses, 4 and 5, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after killing the body, has power to throw you into hell. One little tidbit I just want to bring out. He calls them my friends. Nowhere else in the synoptic gospels, that's Mark, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, does Jesus ever refer to his disciples as friends. Only one other place in the gospels, and it's in the gospel of John. We see it. In John 15, no one has greater love than this than he laid down his life for his friends. I'm just going to skip to uh, verse 15. But I have called you friends because I have revealed to you everything I heard from my Father. What a privilege. The fact that God reveals himself to us. That's why he calls us his friends. He's chosen to make himself known. Don't fear men. The Pharisees were afraid of men. John chapter 12, verse 42. At the same time, it says, many, even among the leaders, the religious leaders, believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their face, their faith, nor, excuse me, I'll read that again. I'll get it straight the first time here, second time. Because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogues. They were afraid of men more than they were afraid of God. Scripture here uses the term that they believed, and yet they were fearful of men. The question I ask myself, were they true believers? I doubt that. You see, my friend, if you confess with your mouth, and maybe you believe in your heart, but your life denies Christ, he will deny you. If your mouth confesses, but you deny him with your life, he will deny you. James says of the demons, you believe that there's one God? Chapter 2, verse 19, good. Even the demons believe that and they shudder. You see this peripheral surface expression of belief. God looks at the heart. And he's the one who transforms the heart as a result of true belief. He knows. So let's review quickly here. 
Why should we honor or fear God? Well, because he will reveal everything. Hypocrisy will be unmasked. Secondly, because he has the power of eternal life and death and can thrust into hell. Our third truth here, actually, I really should jump ahead, but I'm going to go ahead and insert in the order of the passage, verses 6 and 7, we have an encouragement in the midst of all this fear. What is the encouragement? Verses 6 and 7. Encouragement for every true believer, trusting God in every circumstance. God's complete knowledge, his ability to reveal all hypocrisy, extends, that knowledge extends to us as believers. He knows everything about you if you are a believer in Christ. And there's no reason to be afraid because of Christ. So, he knows everything, and he cares for those who truly belong to him. So, we have here in verses 6 and 7, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? He's talking here about this very small copper coin, uh, and the research I did was it can be anywhere from uh, one twelfth of a denarius, which is your daily wage. I saw one estimation of all the way up to 128th of a, like, I don't, these people don't have it right. We didn't live there. We, we don't know it all. But the bottom line is I think we can get the picture, very minuscule amount of money. It's interesting here. He says, uh, are not five sparrows? Now, you know, ever since studying this passage for weeks, I've been noticing birds a lot more. I don't know if you notice birds. We went south, you know, and of course, you're going on through the, dairy, the dairies. You know, what do you got there? Birds everywhere. What do you have in my backyard? Well, finches and doves. I love finches. They're just like the most minuscule. Like they're, they're equivalent to sparrows here. Little tiny little things. And they just, they hop around, whatever. They never walk. They hop, you know. And, and, and they, all that they do, and of course, I have a bunch of them there, probably because I feed them. But, but I love to watch them as such a marvel. And, you know, they come in from, they are like, they're like jet. They are like arrows. Like what, they go and they zoom in and they, bam, and they stick the landing every time. They don't go, bum, 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 and then finally, they don't do that. They're amazing. They're absolutely amazing. Well, Jesus uses this picture of these sparrows. Well, what in the world, why would you buy a sparrow? Well, the poor, they would buy them and they'd eat them. They'd eat them. Now Luke is interesting compared with this passage in Matthew. Matthew says, can't you get two sparrows for a penny? And here Matthew says what? Hey, you can get five for two. See, Matthew's looking for the better deal. <laughs> I like that about, I'm, excuse me, did I say Matthew? Luke, I'll get that right. Anyway, so are not one of them, one, not one of them. And they're everywhere. They're like dust. In fact, as I googled, how many birds? I don't know who counted them. Nobody. The estimate is, a, well, what are we up to now? Population-wise, uh, 8.2 billion, I was finally told, of, of people. Birds, estimate, 150 billion. That's a lot. That's a lot. And he says, not one of them is forgotten by God. And then in Matthew... And this really hit home. It says here, literally, not one of them falls to the ground without your father. My dear friends, those of you who have lost spouses, like myself, that's what came to my mind. Not one of us falls without the Lord. He knows, oh, how much he knows about each one of us. But he knows every sparrow. He knows every detail. Well, and he goes on, and he says, what about hairs on your head? Indeed, the very hairs on your head are numbered. He doesn't say, I know how many there are. He says, they're numbered. Oh, there went number down the drain, 4,623. Oh, there went number, oh, you know, some of you, well, I don't know if you're trying to hide the fact that you don't have much hair or by shaving your heads or just, you know, what. You know, there's kind of, we have a, 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 we have a variety in this group. 
For some of you, it's not really hard for the Lord to keep so, so much track. But, you know, there's, there's the aspect that there's 100, roughly 150,000 hairs on every human head. I don't know if he's talking about uh, the hairs of our whole body, whatever. It's nothing to him. Nothing. He knows everything. And he wraps this up by reminding us, my dear friends, you are worth so much more than sparrows so much more he knows everything about you your needs your circumstances your situation and he cares nothing falls without him huh is hair important well look at all the restorer ads they're out there aren't they and that picture, that, that term of not a hair will fall from your head is used throughout Scripture to illustrate God's protection of his people. Fourth warning, we need to move on. Verses 8 and 9. I tell you, whoever acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge him before the angels of God. But he who disowns me before men will be disowned before the angels of God. The principle we have here is very important. You cannot honor God the Father unless you honor the Son. We've seen that God will reveal all hypocrisy. We need to fear God because he has the power of eternal life and death. We rest on the truth that God knows everything and cares for you. And here we are challenged to confess Christ. He who does not honor the John, John chapter 5, verse 23. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, You can't come to the Father but by me. In John 15, he who hates me hates my father. They are pointing to one another. We need to fear God. We need to honor the son because he, thus, if you honor the son, you are honoring the father, the one who sent him, Jesus says. There's a clear and a necessary truth here. It's a mandate. You must make the choice. Whoever acknowledges, and the word there is confess. What does it mean to confess Christ? Whoever confesses me before men, it's not a secret confession. It's not something you hold in your heart and keep a secret. No, religion is private. That's not what Jesus says. Whoever confesses me before men, I will confess him before the angels of God. And whoever disowns me before men, and he, he heightens the verb here and says, he will be totally disowned by me before the angels of God. Honor Christ by confessing him. Whether, well, what do we need to confess? Well, we know 1 John 1, 9. If we are confessing our sins and what does it mean? It means to say the same thing about. Well, in regard to my sin, it means when God says, he tells me to confess my sin, he's telling me to say, yep, God, you're right, it's sin. Recent story of a fellow who said, I came to Christ later in life, and somebody asked him, what did you do before that? He goes, sin a lot. <laughs> Very apt. So to confess is to agree with, to say the same thing, to speak the truth about. So what do we have to confess in regard to Christ? What truth must we confess about him? His person, his work, his word. His person, his work, his word. Well, if you confess with your mouth, again, I'm going to remind you of this. But your life denies him. He will deny you. So to honor Christ is to confess all that is true about him. His deity, his humanity, his sovereignty. Don't have time to go into each one of those. It's interesting that his sovereignty 
In Acts, Jesus is called Savior two times. And he's called Lord 99 times. And in the whole New Testament, Jesus is called Savior less than 10 times and Lord more than 700 times. We must give up our lives to come to him. The Pharisees weren't willing to do it. And some who say they believed feared men more than God. They were not willing to give up their lives for Christ. No, we must die to ourselves. Confessing Christ, the truth about him. Well, fifth truth or warning. We see here in verse 10. Now, I don't have time to go into the angel thing. I wish I did. Uh, before angels, you know, it's the verse in Revelation. Oh, goodness. 14.10. Speaking of those who will drink of the cup of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured out full strength into the cup of his wrath, he will be tormented by burning sulfur, note this, in the presence of of the holy angels and the Lamb. They will behold the suffering of those who refused to confess Christ. You know, and some say, well, I haven't denied him. I haven't denied him. And Jesus says, if you're not for me, you are against me. There's no middle ground. There's no middle ground. Fifth warning. Verse 12, everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. Well, this is interesting. Speak against Christ. Well, what's he talking about? Oh, my friends. You know, for every true believer here in this building, there was a time when you were not one. When we were not believers, we stiff-armed the Lord. We lived our own lives. We did what we pleased, what pleased us. We followed him. And what we were doing, we're denying Christ. Every person has said no to Jesus initially. And Jesus says here, that can be forgiven. That can be forgiven. How? Well, by paying attention to what the Holy Spirit calls us to. And he says here, however, the next portion of the verse... But anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. There's a lot of misunderstanding in reference to this passage. We don't have much time to consider, but what we have to think is this. In order to avoid hypocrisy, which will destroy us, don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Well, what does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? What is the Spirit? What is it about the Spirit? The Spirit reveals Christ, even as Christ reveals and points to the Father. So to blaspheme the Holy Spirit is to reject the revelation about who Christ is. Why do I say that? Well, let's consider purpose, the purpose of the Holy Spirit according to the Lord Jesus Christ. Just a few verses to get it straight in our hearts. No one in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 who is speaking by the Spirit of God I'm going to jump ahead. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Because we have believed the testimony of the Spirit of God. What is the testimony of the Spirit of God? Well, John chapters 15 and 16 reveal some very interesting things. In John 15, 26, when the counselor comes, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, whom I will send to you from the Father, who is that? The spirit of truth who goes out from the Father. What's he going to do? He will testify about me. And in John 16, 7, I tell you the truth. It's good that I'm going away because unless I go away, the counselor, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict or convince the world of three things. Guilt. 
in regard to sin, righteousness, and judgment. Can't talk about righteousness and judgment right now, but I can talk about sin because in John 16, 9, Jesus says in regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. As a result, the Spirit of God is seeking to convince people of their guilt and their desperate need for Christ. And it says, why are they in their sin? Because they do not believe in me. And later in John 16, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. It's the spirit of God that God uses to set forth the word, the truth, to convince men's heart. And if you reject that, basically what you're saying, I reject the Spirit of God, I blaspheme him, I refuse to believe. And there is no remedy. There's no solution. If you speak, if you reject the revelation of God through the Spirit, you can't be saved. What did the Pharisees do in the previous chapter? Christ's work was attributed to Satan by them. They refused to believe the Spirit of God's work through the Lord Jesus. How did the Spirit work through Christ? Well, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. At his baptism, the Spirit descended upon him. He was full of the Spirit, we see, when he went to be tempted. He returned from the temptation in the power of the Spirit. He proclaimed, the Spirit of the Lord is on me when he spoke the word in the synagogue. In Acts 10, it says that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. Well... That's a reason to fear. There's no remedy if you reject Christ, the testimony of the Spirit of God. In conclusion, the last two verses, we see an encouragement. You may wonder, like, well, wait a minute. What did verses 11 and 12, why does he bring this up here about possible persecution that he actually foretells. They're going to bring you before synagogues, rulers, authorities. Don't worry. Don't worry. What? Oh, I can only picture myself. <gasps> I'm scared to death. What if, what if I don't know what to say? What if, what if I shrink back? What if, what, I, might, I might die. No. Well, yeah, maybe. What if? He says here, do not be concerned do not worry because the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. We have a living example right in this congregation. I've asked Matt to come, if he would come right now, and just share a brief story of how he lived this. Right over that one. That way they can see you. So we were missionaries in Liberia in the late 80s, early 90s, and... Um, War came to town, and um, not a lot we could do about it. We could have fled. We didn't take that chance. And so things got pretty hairy. And at one point, uh, people came into our house, rebels. They were young boys, 14, 15 years old. And they were commandeering things. That's what their word. They were called themselves commandos. And um, we were contemplating leaving. One day, I was driving through town. The rebels were there. Uh, pretty hairy time. And one young man, uh, 14 years old, with an AK-47, started waving me down to stop. And so I stopped. Um, and he said, I'm commandeering your vehicle. Get down. Get out of the vehicle. It's mine now. And I didn't know what to say. Um, we had two babies, Brenda and I, and we needed the vehicle to be able to evacuate when it was time to evacuate, and we were thinking it was getting pretty close to that time. And I was at a complete loss for words. I couldn't give up my vehicle, but I couldn't argue with a kid. He had his gun up to my head. 
I didn't have any way to argue with him. And it was in that moment that the Lord just gave me, uh, I believe, the answer, which was to say to him, I'm sorry, but this is not my vehicle. This is God's vehicle. Look at the door. And he stepped back, and on the door of the vehicle was painted SIM, that's our mission, ELWA, which were the, was the call sign for the radio station in our country. A very famous radio station. Everybody knew that was God's station. We broadcast the gospel. And he said, I am so sorry, Pastor. Carry on. And he let me drive through. Hallelujah. What do we see? Why is that included here? Because the same spirit of God, the same God that knows every detail of your life and cares for you and protects you, the same one that, the same spirit that has set forth and points to Christ in every way, is the same spirit who will be with you no matter what crisis, no matter what persecution, no matter what situation you may find. He will be there with the true believer. But if you do not know Christ, you need to recognize that your hypocrisy if you pretend, oh, we're good at it. You know, kids, I'm going to talk to you, younger people. Oh, you're good at pretending because you want to please mom and dad. You want them to think good of you. God knows the heart. Us older people, I'm not sure. Everybody, maybe we want to please people too. And we put up a pretense as well. God will uncover the truth. Everything will be revealed. You know, hypocrites, hypocrites know who they are. They know they're hypocrites. So you need to fear that revelation. You need to fear God because he's the one with the power of eternal life and death. If you belong to Christ, you know that he will take care of you and you can take great comfort in that. If you confess Christ, agree with what the Spirit of God testifies about him, you will be honored and acknowledged before God and the angels of heaven. If not, you will be denied totally by Christ. That's a reason to fear. Believe the revelation, the truth about Christ through the Holy Spirit and take great comfort in his care for you. Examine yourselves. Paul tells us to examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith, 2 Corinthians 13. My challenge to you is to examine yourself. Where do you stand? Father, we acknowledge you search the heart. We ask that you would search our hearts and help us not to wear the mask that when we look in the mirror that we see the mask rather than the truth. God, help us to be true before you to fear you appropriately, to come to you out of that, and to find relief from all fear because Christ has paid the believer's penalty in full. And we rejoice in that truth. In Jesus' name.